nice to see so many of you here today. Say hello to the, to the students here. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Michael Anderson. I'm the Divisional Dean for Ag and Natural Resources. And on behalf of the University of California Riverside's College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the third lecture in the 2016 Science Lecture Series entitled Sustainability in a Time of Rapid Change, the Future of Earth, Life, and Humanity. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jim Sickman. Dr. Sickman is a watershed biogeochemist and limnologist who investigates carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus uh, cycling in lakes, rivers, and watersheds. He's also the chair of the Department of Environmental Sciences here at UCR. He earned his bachelor's degree in aquatic biology, master's degree in aquatic and ecosystem sciences, and PhD in watershed biogeochemistry from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Jim has been conducting research in the high elevation lakes of the Sierras for, uh, and watersheds of the Sierras for the past uh, 30 years and has unrivaled experience on the variability and complexity of the hydrologic cycle and hydrology of the Sierra Nevada. His current research involves the use of lake sediment cores to reconstruct the past 10,000 years of history of snowpack variation in the Sierra Nevada using paleoclimate. The title of tonight's talk, Change is the only constant 10,000 years of climate variability in California and what it means to our water supply. Please join me in welcoming Jim Sickman. Thank you, Michael. All right, thanks for coming out. I know this is dinner time, everybody's hungry, so uh, I, I hope this is uh, worth it. <laughs> so today I'm gonna talk about some of my research in the Sierra Nevada. And, and I've been very lucky because I actually got to start this research when I was an undergraduate at UCSB. So I've been able to work at the same study site since I was about 22 years old. And I, I guess you know, when we, you talk about climate change and global warming, it's kind of hard to get a, a perspective, right? People move around and it's hard to, to sort of get a feel for the natural world so maybe when you live in a city. But I, I've been going up into the Sierra for decades and I can kind of actually see climate change at work, just in my own experience. So I'm gonna be talking about a little bit of that today. All right. Let's see here. I'm sorry, that was all queued up. Here we go. Okay, so I was just up in the Sierra Nevada doing a, an annual snow survey. That's actually, you can see in that picture, that's me skiing across the snowpack there. That's in Sequoia National Park. We actually have a snowpack this year. The last couple of years, it's been debatable whether there was any snow or not. We had to look really hard to find it. So I was just up there, so I, I'm kind of giving you a, a, a current perspective on what you would find if you were in the Sierra Nevada right now. So today's talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about four main things. The first is I'm gonna talk about California's water supply through time. So I think in order to understand the importance of the snowpack and snowmelt to California's water supply, you have to understand how the water supply works. And so we're gonna go through that and you're gonna learn a little bit about the water conveyance systems in California, where they're located, what their risks are to say climate change and earthquakes and things like that. So we're gonna, we're gonna kind of track that through time then we're gonna talk about the current drought. I'm calling it the millennial drought because I, I think that what we've experienced in the last two years may happen maybe once every two or 3,000 years. So I, I've really changed my perspective on what drought means by looking at what happened in the last couple of years. So you're actually experiencing something that maybe doesn't happen for thousands of years. So we're gonna talk about that. And then third, we're gonna look into the, to the paleo archives. We're gonna look at tree ring records to see just how exceptional this drought is. Uh, you know, whether droughts like this have happened in the past or if droughts even more severe have been observed uh, over the last uh, 10,000 years. And then finally, we're gonna talk about the future of California's water supply. So where do we go from here? As population grows, from about 30 million up to 50 million, how are we gonna supply water to all these people given all the risks to our water conveyance system, the risk to our snowpack uh, due to climate change? So we're, we're gonna kinda try to end on a, a positive note, but a lot of what I'm gonna tell you is definitely not positive. 
Okay. All right. Before we begin, I want to talk about this word drought. So people, people throw this word out, right? They, they say, we're in a drought, or it'll take, it'll take this much rain to get out of the drought, or we'll never get out of the drought. So um, I, thought, I, I, I looked it up in the dictionary to see what drought meant. And so these are a couple of def definitions of drought, but, and they all kind of revolve around this idea of the lack of rainfall, right? So it would be a prolonged period without rainfall. But in California, if you think about it, you know, starting about right now, it stops raining normally. And it doesn't start raining again until October or November. So, so every year we have several months, especially in Southern California, where it doesn't rain very much or, or any at all. So do, do these kind of classic definitions of drought really make any sense when you talk about California? They're kind of de developed for more wet climate, like the East Coast or the South of the United States. So. Uh, we're going to come back to this idea of drought, and I hope, and I'm going to propose a new definition of drought for you at the end, and hopefully you'll you'll agree that it's a better definition for California. All right, so let's talk about California's water supply through time, and so this is a a picture, a couple of pictures that I thought really sum up a remarkable progression in our technology. So the the first picture here is uh, kind of a reenactment of the Padres at the mission and they're using horse-drawn plows to plant crops and they're hoping and praying that it's going to rain. And that was the only way they could water their crops. It was by rainfall. On the other side, I have a picture of a desalination plant where they're taking seawater and removing the salt and making fresh water, millions of gallons a day. So in little more than 125 years, we've gone from being completely dependent on rainfall to being able to produce massive amounts of water from the ocean. So let's, let's look at how the water system in California has changed over the, the last 100, 125 years, because it's a, it's a pretty remarkable story. Right. So one thing you have to know about California and its water supply is that there's a real disconnect between where it rains a lot and where people like to live. So I guess people don't like to live in California where it rains a lot. They like to live down here where it doesn't rain and it's sunny every day and warm. So the, these two graphs kind of show this. The graph on the left is average annual precipitation. So the red colors mean very little precipitation, and the greens and blue mean it's wetter. So you can see that there, the Southern California is kind of dry, the Central Valley here is dry, and the Sierra Nevada is wet, and the Northern California is wet. The graph on the right shows population, so the red colors mean denser population. So we have lots of population in Southern California and the Bay Area, which aren't the areas where a lot of rain falls. So what California decided to do, maybe starting at the early 20th century, is to move the water from where it's abundant to where the people are. If you look at, to kind of put this in perspective, the spatial variability, the, the, the variability of rainfall from point to point in California varies by 20-fold. So the driest parts of California receive you know, one twentieth of the amount of rainfall that the wettest parts do. Um, if you look at another state, I picked Maine, for example, the variability, the spatial variability of rainfall is really low. It's only about 2%. So it's, it's only the western states where we have this disconnect between where people live and where rainfall falls. And, and it's really only in the, in the southwest that we have these large water transfer systems, uh, which we're going to learn about. All right, so many of you probably don't know this, maybe some of you do, but there's the most important place in California, and it's called the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, and you're probably thinking, what do you mean? San Francisco, Silicon Valley, you know, Hollywood, those have got to be the most important places in California. And I, and I would argue that you're wrong, because this place, Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, is what I would call the nexus of water. So all the water, virtually, that, that the state of California uses, except for some little bits, pass through this area. So let's see, can I, can you guys see this arrow on the screen? Probably not, okay, so I'm just gonna use the mouse. So what this is, this picture is a perspective like we're out in space. We're in the space shuttle, we're looking down. Uh, here's Sacramento, here's Stockton, here, over this way is Sacramento, or is the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, right over here. So if you went out further to the west, you'd be in San Francisco. And what, 
we're seeing here is where, where all the major rivers in California meet. So the Sacramento River comes down here. Here's, well, I guess Mount Shasta is up here. Comes down here to the Delta. The San Joaquin River comes in from the south. Rivers come in from the east, from the Sierra. And they all meet here in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. Now, it's a little hard, I know, I'm sorry, this isn't bigger, but you can see all these little islands in here, right? They're separated by these little river channels. Those are agricultural islands. They, they grow a lot of potatoes and asparagus there. But one of the things that's really remarkable is that those islands are below sea level. The soil has eroded the, away, and on parts of those islands, you might be 15 to 20 feet below sea level. So I've been on these islands, you, you stand on them, and you see a giant ship going by over your head. And it's really bizarre. Um, so, the, so the only reason these islands exist is because they have dikes and levees around them, just like in the Netherlands. So this is a very vulnerable place. All right. So we have the Sacramento River coming in from the north, the San Joaquin River coming in from the south, a bunch of rivers come in from the Sierra Nevada to the east. There's a tidal influence because the, the tides go in and out. But what's important is down here in the southern part, you can see this little reservoir. It's called Clifton Court 4 Bay. And it's hard for you to see, but I put two black arrows here. That's the takeoff point for the two largest aqueducts in California, the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project. So any of you who've driven on Highway 5 up to San Francisco, have you seen those big canals by the highway? That's where they begin, right at the southern part of the delta. So they take water out of the delta and they move it into the southern San Joaquin Valley and into Southern California. So that's why this area is so important because so much water that's crucial to California passes through there. All right, so let's, let's go back to my original idea of let's, let's look at water supply through time. So we go back into the 1800s, water was a real local source. You know, you, you depended on what fell out of the sky, Maybe you had a hand held or a hand dug well that you could take water out of, but it was pretty primitive. You know, you, the amount of crops you could grow kind of depended on how much it rained that year. The first major water system that was built in California was built by San Francisco. It's the Hetch Hetchy system. So in Yosemite National Park, there's another valley outside of Yosemite Valley. It's called Hetch Hetchy. And there's a picture of it. It's a little hard to see, but it was beautiful. It had the big granite slabs like Half Dome and El Capitan, not quite at the scale of Yosemite Valley, but very beautiful. And John Muir opposed the building of the dam in Hetch Hetchy. Uh, he, I think he called it one of his greatest failures, that he couldn't prevent that dam. But the upside of it was that San Francisco has one of the best uh, municipal water supplies in the world because they get this beautiful snowmelt water from Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. And this was built in 1913. So the folks in uh, Oakland and the East Bay said, hey, you know, we want our own water system. So they built another aqueduct. This is called the East Bay Municipal Utility District Aqueduct. And they tied into the McCulmany River, which is a, a pretty large river draining into the uh, Central Valley. And so they have their own uh, water system. And this was built in about 1929. So you're starting to see a pattern now. If, the, if you don't have enough water, you just build an aqueduct to where the water is. The next one was built by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, uh, and they built several aqueducts all throughout California. That's the purple uh, little lines there that you're seeing up here. And uh, they built aqueducts mainly to supply agriculture because it was overdrafting of groundwater, and the farmers said, hey, we need a surface water supply, and the U.S. Bureau, Bureau of Reclamation came in and built those. Then we built the State Water Project in the 1960s. That was basically the crown jewel. It's, a, it's an engineering marvel. It probably has no equal in the world. It brings water all the way from Northern California up here, Mount Shasta or, or Shasta Lake, all the way down into Southern California. There's also a branch that goes off to the Central Coast. So this is one of the largest aqueducts in the world. And Los Angeles also built it, the, its own LA aqueduct. Um, on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada. So basically, this is the plumbing that we have right now in California to move water around. So what threats do we face? So since many of the islands in the delta are below sea level, sea level rise is a concern. Because as sea level rises, the pressure on those levees goes up and up and up. 
So this is a chart kind of showing the sea level rise during the 20th century. It went up about 20 centimeters, which we were able to kind of cope with. We could build the levees a little bit higher. But projections suggest that sea level over the next 80 years, 85 years, is going to go up at least a meter, at minimum a meter, maybe more than that. And so as that water level rises, the pressure on those levees is going to go up. And if they don't break just because of the water pressure, there's one other thing we can be concerned with, and that is earthquakes. So the area in the delta is seismically active. Earthquakes on the order of, of uh, you know, a five or six point on the Richter scale are, are possible. And so people have done uh, modeling scenarios to look at what would happen to the levees in the, in the delta if a 6.5 magnitude earthquake hit. And that's, this is one of the simulations. If you look at this, it's red. Red means salt water. So what would happen is that many of the levees, maybe upwards of 20 islands, would flood. And they wouldn't flood with river water. They would actually flood with seawater from San Francisco Bay. So what would happen is that the delta would be full of seawater, and we couldn't pump fresh water out into the aqueducts. And this might be the case for years. So Southern California's supply of water from Northern California could be cut off for years. It may, it, you know, and that's why Governor Brown actually wants to build this tunnel around the delta because it would lessen the risk of a, a catastrophic failure of the water system because of an earthquake. Right. We have one other aqueduct. So you think, well, we're taking all the water from Northern California. That's got to be enough. But it's not enough for Southern California. We actually take water from the Rocky Mountains. So our water footprint not only includes Northern California, but it also includes a lot of the Rocky Mountains because we've actually built an aqueduct system to the Colorado River called the Colorado River Aqueduct. This is a little map kind of showing it. It starts at Lake Havasu. And uh, so here it is right there. So not only are we taking Northern California, Sierra Nevada runoff, we're actually getting runoff all the way from the Rocky Mountains. OK, so that's a, I think, you're probably tired of learning about the water system in California, but hopefully you learned something new. Um, and it's going to help us understand the rest of the talk. OK, so I want, now I want to shift our focus to the millennial drought. That's what I'm calling it. So this is a picture of Lake Oroville. It's one of the most important reservoirs in the State Water Project. Uh, it stores massive amounts of water. And this is what it looked at like last fall. So it's almost empty. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of good news. The reservoir spilled. Uh, they let water out uh, just a, a few days ago. So it's actually very close to full now because we had a good winter. But I don't want to spoil the, the negative story, so I'll, I'll just keep going there. <laughs> so I'm just I'm doom and gloom for a while. All right. All right, so this is, this is the Sierra Nevada snowpack right here. You can see it right here. Here it was in 2013, which was kind of a normal year. Here was 2014. You can see there's very little snow. It's only at the highest elevations. In 2015, it looked even worse. So we started to, to actually have a shortage of snowfall. Now, the state of California does these uh, snow surveys every year. Many, many places. They send teams out, and they go and measure how much snow is on the ground and how much water is kept in that uh, snow. This is what I do in my own research sites. Uh, my records only go back into the early 80s, so I'm showing you this longer record from Donner Summit which is near Lake Tahoe. So what we're looking at here is uh, 1906 to 2016. This is the amount of water equivalents of the snow. Let's say you took a column of snow and you melted it into water. This is how many inches of water you would have. So on the order of you know, 10 to, to 70 inches of water are typically on the ground at Donner Summit on April 1st. So, um, yeah, you know, you, you every so often you see a low year, but there's, it's just an occasional low year. But if you look at what we've experienced from, say, 2013, 2014, 2015, it's way over here. It's hard to see because the bars are so tiny. And there's actually a really, really tiny, tiny, almost infinitesimal bar in the year 2015. So it's, it's kind of unprecedented that we would have the two driest years in the last 100 years consecutively. And that's what was so remarkable about the last two years. Another thing to note about the Sierra Nevada snowpack, and maybe a reason that we shouldn't completely rely on it as a water supply, is it's tremendously variable. 
So the range of values between the lowest snow year and the highest snow year in the Sierra is 174 times. The lowest year is 0.5 inches at Donner Summit. The highest is 87 inches. So we have a tremendously variable snowpack, but yet we're trying to supply 35 million people with a reliable source of water. Right. This is Sequoia National Park about last week. Uh, this is my main study site, Emerald Lake in, in Sequoia National Park. You can see there's snow. That was really good. Uh, th we're on the lake here. We've just drilled a hole through the ice and we've collected water samples and zooplankton out. Um, so this is typical. We go up there in April, we can walk right out on the lake and we have uh, a place to stand. But I want to show you this little movie, and we'll see if this works, of what it was like in 2015 when we went up there in April. All right, let's see. This is supposed to be funny. <laughs> oh, you can't see it, darn it. Well, let's see. I'll show it again. Oh, well. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right, let's start it over. Okay. There we go. So this is unprecedented. We've never had to take the boat out in April to get onto the lake. And so, it, and it wasn't just that we could row out there, we had to actually break the ice with a shovel. So one of the grad students did a time lapse. And uh, so it's kind of funny. So I'm glad you could see it. So not, not only was the snowpack light in uh, 2015, it was very warm. Here's some other uh, webcam data or webcam photos to kind of give you a sense of how dry last year was. This is a webcam of Half Dome. This is kind of what it looks like in 2011, then 2012, and you can start to see the snow starts to fail from year to year. And in 2015, there was almost no snow. Right. So what has this lack of rainfall and snowfall done to the ecosystems in the Sierra Nevada? What's it done to the forests? If you haven't been up there lately and you go up there now, you'll be shocked what you see. So there's been some really interesting uh, data to come out, these remote sensing images that have been produced by this uh, Carnegie Institute for Science. They've flown planes over the Sierra Nevada and they have these multispectral sensors that can look at the water content of the vegetation and tell how water stressed the vegetation are. So they've been flying around taking pictures of the forests in the Sierra Nevada and elsewhere in California. And this is what they're finding. So the red colors in these images mean that the trees are drought stressed and the blue means that they have enough water. And so you can see this is a, an image from Sierra National Forest which is right near Sequoia National Park. And you can see that most of the trees are very stressed. Uh, it's only the trees that are on north-facing slopes or in gullies that are, are, have enough water. Okay, but what does it look like on the ground? All right, so if you go up there right now, this is what you're gonna see. Thousands and millions of dead trees. So the mixed conifer zone in the Sierra Nevada starts around 5,000 feet, goes up to 7,000 feet. There's a lot of mixture between conifers, things like cedars and pines and firs and oaks. And in this zone, in Sequoia National Park, literally every conifer is dead. It's, it's heartbreaking to see it. And um, on the trails that I hike, there's very, very old trees like ponderosa pine and uh, uh, other, other large pines that are maybe 400 years old, they're dying because, not just because of bark beetle infestation, but just because of, of acute lack of water. So the forest in the Sierra Nevada, including the, the blue oak forest in the, in the foothills, whole hillsides, south facing hillsides of oaks are dead. It's, it's just unbelievable that the mortality of, of, uh, of trees right now. And it's so remarkable that the USDA actually, Forest Service actually released a, um, a news release basically saying that you know dead trees are visible in staggering numbers. So if you go up there, you're going to see something that probably hasn't been, hasn't occurred in thousands of years. All right. Okay. So I haven't talked about groundwater yet. That's another terrible story. <laughs> so let's get right into it. So, um, so what do we do? What does California do when we don't get enough snow? 
do we you know, do we die of thirst? Do we stop growing crops? Do we stop taking showers? Has anybody really noticed that we're in a drought? Has it? Have you noticed the vegetation at your apartment dying or anything? No, because we have what I would call an ace in the hole, pun intended. We have groundwater. We have actually a lot of groundwater in California, but we're actually misusing it. We're using it much too fast. This is a picture. This is uh, Joe Poland. He's in the San Joaquin Valley, and he's trying to give everybody an idea of just how much groundwater overdrafting has occurred in the, in the San Joaquin Valley. This is an old famous picture, but basically what he's showing is that the land surface elevation in, this, in the San Joaquin Valley has decreased by tens of meters because of groundwater pumping. As you pump the water out of the ground, the ground subsides. And so this is actually the largest land subsidence in the world. It's the largest human alteration to the Earth's surface in the world, this depression of the San Joaquin Valley. So, and this hasn't stopped. If anything, it's accelerated. Right. This is data, very interesting data from the USGS that's based on uh, surface elevation measurements. And then later, there's a, a satellite that NASA operates. It's called GRACE. And it measures the amount of groundwater by variations in gravity. It's a very, very amazing instrument. And what we're looking at here, this red line is basically tracing the deficit of groundwater with withdrawal. You know, how much, it, like your bank account, let's say how overdrawn your bank account is because you're spending too much. So we're spending too much groundwater. And what you see is, you know, in a, a dry period, it goes down really rapidly. We get a big and big, di bigger and deficit. And then we get some wet years and it goes back up. But we, those wet years never replenish the groundwater. So we have this, this continual deficit of groundwater uh, in California. And the amount is enormous. It's a, I know it's a little hard to tell from the scale and everything, but let me just say that it would take about two and a half or three years of, of all the, the, well, the top 10 rivers in California, if you took all that water and pumped it back into the ground, you could make up the deficit. But, it, it, but that would never happen, right? So, I mean, but that gives you an idea uh, of how large this volume is. It's also equal to about two thirds of the volume of Lake Tahoe. That's how much our deficit of groundwater is in California. Or if we took the water that it's equal to and spread it over the state, it would fill the state to nine inches. So it's an enormous amount of water. We'll never make it up. It'll never rain enough for us to do that. Okay, so that's the millennial drought. Let's, how bad is it? Am I, am I right? Is this a drought that would only occur once every one or two or 3,000 years? So let's look at the, the paleo data. Right, so this is a, an interesting photograph from National Geographic. It shows a little submersible, and it's in Lake Tahoe. And what, what do you think that the submersible's looking at right there? What is it? A tree, yeah, a tree on the bottom of Lake Tahoe. How, how could a tree get on the bottom of Lake Tahoe? And this is not a log that was cut and it went into the lake and somehow stood up on end. This is a tree that grew when Lake Tahoe's water level was 100 feet lower than it is today. So one of the ways we can look at the past climate is by looking at tree ring records. So the, the width of the rings, the chemical composition of the rings will reflect the, cl the climate at the time that the ring grew. So you could imagine in years where there's a, uh, it's very arid and there's not much uh, rainfall that the rings will be small and in years where it's wet, the rings will be bigger. So that's the basic idea here. So from these tree ring records, they can actually reconstruct past uh, rainfall. And so this is a reconstruction that's been uh, done for the whole western United States, the southwest. And you can see here that this is kind of the, you know, the, around the year 2000. And, and the higher you, up, up, you are up on this graph, the more of a drought you're in. The lower down, the more wet it is. So if you go up, it's, it's a drought. If you go down, it's a wet period. And so the, the, uh, the you know, recent history has not been all that remarkable. If you go back in time, you look back at the years between, say, 900 and 1300 AD, there were large areas of the southwestern US that were in a drought. So th those periods of time were much drier than we had ever seen up until maybe the present day. So if you had asked me five years ago whether the droughts that I had lived through were remarkable, I'd say, well, no. In between 900 and 1300 AD, there were much worse droughts. We'd better be on the lookout, and hopefully that never happens. 
but I, I think that maybe we've actually had one of those occur. This is data uh, reconstruction using uh, tree rings for the Merced River, which drains out of the Sierra Nevada. And here's the, you know, the, the time period around uh, the turn of the century, around the year 2000. And again, uh, in, in this case, if you go up, it means wetter. If you go down, it, it means drier. So pretty wet conditions at the end of the 20th century. But look here. Look how low the flow got in the Merced River. And this is between about 900 and 1300 AD. The flow that's been reconstructed by the tree rings is much, much lower. So again, if you ask me in the year 2000 whether the droughts I'd seen were remarkable, I'd say, no way. Look at this record. Way worse droughts have happened. All right. What about Lake Tahoe? I showed you that picture earlier with those trees. Uh, Here's a picture of a, a man in a submersible with one of those trees growing up. I and mean, these trees are two or 300 feet below the surface of Lake Tahoe. So Lake Tahoe, hundreds to thousands of years ago, was much lower because it was much drier. They actually sent divers down and collected wood from these trees, and they did radiocarbon dating. Uh, some of the trees in Lake Tahoe dated back to about 3,500 BC, which was five or 6,000 years ago. Uh, and some of the other lakes nearby, like Independence Lake, Fallen Leaf Lake, and Donner Lake, they also found trees underwater. And they dated those back, maybe not coincidentally, to a period of between a, about 1,000 and 1,300 AD. So California experienced some very major droughts for about uh, you know, two or 300 years around 900, around 1,000 AD. All right. But what about this drought? All right, so this is a recent paper. It came out about a month ago in uh, Nature. And the scientists use blue oak. If you drive into the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, you'll see all these, these smaller oak trees. They're called blue oaks. And they live in a really rough area. It's, it's at the bottom of the, of the Sierra Nevada. It's hot in the summer. It's over 100 degrees. It doesn't get as much rain as the higher elevations. So these blue oaks have to be tough. And, they live for maybe 500 or 700 years, and they record a really nice record of drought in California. All right, so here we are again, another one of these squiggly line graphs. So uh, just note, if you go up, it means it's wet, and if you're going down, it's dry. And so there is one point I want to point out to you, and that is right here. So this is the 2015 drought. This is basically inferred from the tree rings of a blue oak growing in the Sierra Nevada. And you can see in the past, there's, other, there's been other droughts going back until about the year 1500, but none of them reached the, the, the level of dryness that we got in 2015. So these, these researchers actually say that the 2015 snowfall and rainfall in the Sierra has a return interval of 3,100 years. So you probably heard of this idea, well, it was a 100-year flood. It's a flood that might occur every 100 years, or a 50-year flood might occur every 50 years. So this is a drought that these tree rings suggest might occur every 3,000 years. So I think really and truly we have seen the worst of what Mother Nature can deal us in California. The problem is how many years can it deal it to us? Could we have, out of the next 20 years, could we have another five years like this? Maybe that's what the period between 900 and 1300 AD was, is year after year like last year. So that's what's kind of scary about that. Right. Now, my own research has not progressed as far as these other studies because I work on lake sediment cores, which are much harder to deal with than uh, uh, tree rings. So uh, this is a core that I've collected out of uh, a lake in the Sierra Nevada. It's uh, seven meters long, and it actually goes back to the Ice Age. If you look over here, this is the bottom of the core. We've done radiocarbon dating. It's about 13,000 years old. So what we're trying to do is use the layering and sediment characteristics, the grain size, the isotope composition of the sediments to infer what the snowpack was. And that's, that's all I've been working on for the last two or three years. And, but it's a lot of sediment. So <laughs> not, nothing quite yet to pre present. But I just wanted to tell you about what I was doing. All right, so the last part of the talk, I just want to go over the future of California's water supply. So how do we deal with this? It's, I, I hope that you're feeling that, that California's water supply is kind of precarious and that maybe we haven't been treating it 
right. And maybe we're, we're, we're at more risk than we think we are. So what does the future hold? So this is a graph of projections of population growth in California. So right now we're at about oh, 37 million people by the year 2060. Some of you will be around in 2060. We're, we're thinking we're gonna have over 52 million people. So we're gonna add another 14 million people to California. Basically the population of the whole LA basin, we're gonna add another population like that, 38% growth. How are we gonna do this? How are we gonna supply water for all those people to use? How are we gonna supply food for all those people to eat? That's the big question. All right, what do climate projections say about uh, snowfall in the Sierra? Maybe it's gonna snow more. It's, gonna, it's definitely gonna rain more in some places on Earth than else, other places uh, with climate change, but unfortunately, no. The climate models suggest that we're gonna get less snow. It's, California is gonna get more arid. It's been estimated that we might have about a 25% reduction in snowfall, which would be significant, you know, and that's, you know, it means we're gonna have drier years more, more, uh, more frequently. The other problem is that the snowpack's gonna melt earlier in the spring. So right now, the snowpack is our biggest reservoir. It holds more water than all the dams in California. And we like it to stay up in the mountains frozen because we don't have to build our reservoirs larger, uh, and, it, and the snowpack stores the water until we need it. We need it in the summertime to grow food. So we don't want the snowpack to melt in February and March. We want it to melt in May and June when we need the water. So what, but what we're seeing is that there's more flow occurring during the winter time and less during the summertime because of climate change and other changes to the snowpack. So we're, we're, getting a, we're probably gonna get a smaller snowpack in the future and it's gonna melt earlier, which is gonna cause problems. The other thing that's happening, and this is my own data from um, the, the Sierra Nevada, is that we're not only getting dry winters, but we're getting warm winters. This is a little hard to see, but I think once I explain it to you, you'll, you'll understand. So this axis over here is how much snow is in the snowpack in April. So if you're going up, it means it's a big snowpack. If you're going down, it means it's a, it's a light snow year, a small snowpack. And then the color of the bar means whether that winter was warm or cold. So for example, if you look at this year, it was an above normal snowpack and it was cold. Okay, so that kind of makes sense. It snowed more so that it was, it was colder. But what we've seen in the last three years is below normal snowpacks, the driest we've ever seen, and the warmest winters we've ever seen. So it was the combination of those two things that caused Emerald Lake to not freeze and we had to take the boat out. And I think it's the combination of lack of rain and warmth that's killing all the trees in the Sierra because they're not used to having those warm temperatures in the winter time. So they're have, actually having to, to transpire water when they normally would. All right. Why else do I care about the snowpack? Well, I'm just br well, briefly, you know, the, the snowpack actually determines a lot of the characteristics of the lakes that are important, like the temperature of the lakes, the alkalinity of the lakes, other kinds of chemical composition are very strongly affected by the snowpack water content. So you can see there's a, a strong relationship there. But, all right. So what are the solutions? Okay, so I told you I would, I would leave you on a, a couple of positive notes. So here's a couple. So conservation, you know, we've all been conserving water. It really makes a difference. We can live with a lot less water than we do. This is a graph showing the per capita water use of people in California, different regions of the Inland Empire, um, uh, coastal California. And you can see since about 1995, our per capita water use has been going down. And in the last year, we've done really well. We've conserved upwards of 25% of our water use. So we can really conserve water. That's, that's a good thing. What else can we do besides uh, conservation? Well, we can use our water supply more sustainably. One of the, the best things is, that's happened in years is we've decided that we're not gonna just use up all our groundwater. We're gonna try to manage it sustainably. So Governor Brown s signed in 2014 uh, this bill. It's a Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which means there will be regulation on groundwater. Now it's the Wild West. You can go out and drill a well anywhere you want and pump as much groundwater as you want, and no one can stop you. But what's gonna happen through time is we're gonna form these local agencies to manage groundwater, they're gonna come up with plans, and by 2040, 2040, 
we're supposed to be using groundwater sustainably. But my question is, well, what, will, what will our groundwater deficit be in 2040? I, I did a little back of the envelope calculation. It's going to be 60% bigger than it is today. So it's going to take that long to actually come up with these plans, but boy, we're, we're still going to be over pumping groundwater for, for decades to, uh, in the future. Water agencies, what are they doing? So water, water agencies in Southern California are, are kind of fed up dealing with this temperamental snowpack. You know, they want reliable water. So they're moving to, to some unconventional sources of water. The first would be they're building desalination plants. This is the desalination plant in Carlsbad that's going to be used by San Diego. Uh, this is uh, in Orange County, Orange County Water District. They treat, take treated wastewater, treated sewage, and they pump it into the groundwater to replenish the aquifers. So people, uh, are, you know, we're actually living the toilet to tap idea uh, here in Southern California. And then the last thing that we're trying to do is capture storm flow. So we know that when we have a really wet winter, we have lots of flow for a few days. Is there a way to capture that? And this is an example on the Santa Ana River where the water is diverted during high flows and it's put into these settling basins that will recharge the groundwater. So, so we are trying to live more within our means. Southern California is trying to live on the water it controls rather than relying on these, these large aqueduct systems to bring it water. So we're trying to be a bit, a bit more self-sufficient in Southern California. All right, so some things to take away. So I'll just summarize. <coughs> All right, California has a really complex water system and it really depends on snow. If we don't have snow, it doesn't work very well. So our surface water supply depends on the Sierra Nevada snowpack. Secondly, groundwater is a crucial backup. When we don't get the snow, which happens very often, we have to rely on groundwater. But we're misusing groundwater to, to a terrible extent. And as the groundwater tables get lower and lower, the cost to pump the water gets, at, gets higher, the water quality goes down, and there's a point where we can't really use the water anymore if it, if it drops below a critical depth. Third, the paleo archives really give us a broader perspective. You know, we, we only have instrumental records, you know, people records for maybe a hundred years. And so we don't really know how to judge the droughts that we've had in a larger context. But with these archives, these tree ring records, we're able to see, yeah, uh, this drought that we had in the last two years is, is truly exceptional and maybe on the order of a thousand or two thousand year event. And then lastly, I, I wanted to make the point that, you know, the effects of drought are made worse by human-caused problems like global warming. So global warming is causing sea levels to rise, causing extra pressure on levees at the key point in California for water. These levees become more vulnerable to earthquakes. Uh, we have uh, combinations of high temperatures and drought, which are killing trees in the Sierra, affecting lake chemistry and lake temperature. So, you know, we might be seeing the beginning of a wholesale ecological shift occurring in the Sierra Nevada now because of this drought. So it's, uh, you know, things are going to change very rapidly, I think, in the next century. All right, so back to this idea of uh, definition of drought. So this is, this is my definition of drought for California. It doesn't really have anything to do with how much it rains. So my definition is that California is in a continual state of water shortage brought on primarily by ever-growing demand for water. And we're in a continual state of water shortage made worse by global warming and poor water management. So some of these things we have control over. We have control over global warming. We could, we could start to halt it. We could manage our groundwater and surface water better. So we're not powerless. We're not, you know, we, we can change things. We can make things more sustainable if we want to. So that's the end of my talk, and I'll take any questions you have. So if anyone has a question, raise your hand, and one of our science ambassadors will bring you a microphone. Uh, do you see any point or future in educating the public in, in wise uh, water use uh, in terms of your, your macro approach? Uh, yeah. So the question was, is there um, value in educating the, the public on uh, sustainable water management? I say, yeah, there is, because I think they can apply political pressure. 
You know, so I personally think that, that the, the, the San Joaquin Sacramento Delta is too vulnerable. It's too risky for us to be running Southern California's water supply through an area where levees are the only thing protecting us from an inrush of seawater. So I think we need to actually build a tunnel through the delta to lower our risk from an earthquake. So I think as more people learn about the true risks and the true vulnerabilities of our water system, you know, they may not reflexively say, no, I don't want to build a, a tunnel through the delta. It sounds, it sounds like bad environmental um, planning. You know, we should, we should conserve and, and, that, and then we don't have to build the tunnel, but that's not really the case. So I think education is, is really, really key. Since we are close to the ocean, the salination plants should be an alternative, but the problem with that is the cost. Is that any of the yeah. issues with the salination? Okay, so we're close to the ocean, so we, we could potentially increase the number of desalination plants. So there's a, there's a couple of, of downsides. One is the cost. It's much, much more expensive to make drinking water, fresh water out of seawater. Uh, it's very energy intensive. You know, we're burning fossil fuels. Uh, to p supply the electricity to run the desalination plant, yet the, the CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion are causing climate change, which is making us have to use desalination in the first place. So it's kind of a vicious circle. Um, secondly, I think that desalination plants are only really practical at the coast. So it's not as if we could build desalination plants and ship water to the Imperial Valley or Coachella Valley to grow crops. We could We couldn't you couldn't sell the crops, they'd be so expensive. So I think desalination works at kind of a small scale for coastal cities, but most of the inland communities are not going to benefit from desalination. portion of Southern California's water comes from the Colorado River, and who decides that proportion? So what proportion of, of California's water comes from the Colorado River, and who decides how much we get? I don't know the answer to that question, but this person right here probably does know. <laughs> Michael probably knows. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think it varies. So the interesting thing about the Colorado River is that there's, there's a, a, a legal agreement called the, Cal, the Colorado River Compact. And so Arizona, California, who else? Nevada, yeah. They all agreed to divvy up the flow in the Colorado River and they used a period of time when the Colorado River flow was above normal for about a 10 years. And they didn't say, well, we get one third of it, and you get one third of it, and I get one third of it. They said they gave absolute acre feet of water. And California's um, share of the Colorado River had some kind of legal priority over the other states. So for many, many years, California was using its share plus part of Arizona's plus part of Nevada's. But now Arizona and Nevada need the water back, and so our share has actually gone down. Uh, in, Riverside, though, we actually primarily use groundwater from the uh, Bunker Hill Aquifer uh, underlying Riverside and uh, San Bernardino. So we're very dependent on groundwater. The good news about our aquifer is it's not terribly overdrafted. It has a very rapid recharge rate. So we can feel pretty good. Riverside actually is pretty water rich uh, relative to other places in California. How deep would a tunnel need to be uh, uh, put under the, the, the delta? delta? Sometimes, sometimes earthquakes are six miles deep. Yeah, I don't know. Apparently, engineers think that they can build this so it can withstand a, a 6.5 earthquake. Uh, I don't think it would have to be that deep. And they actually have some of the infrastructure already built. Do you remember the peripheral canal? That was the first attempt. They were going to actually build an aqueduct all the way around the delta, and that got stopped. It got stopped partly because of environmental concerns, but the real reason it was stopped was because of the farmers in the delta. They need that fresh water input to keep the salt water out. So if you divert a large volume of water around the delta, the interior channels 
where the farmers today get their water for irrigation would become too salty. So I don't know. I wouldn't imagine it would have to be that deep. I don't think they'd want to make it that deep. But still, it would be enormously expensive. It'd be, it'd be another uh, bullet train, probably. <laughs> Uh, local um, water agencies are asking the governor to lift some of the um, restrictions because they're afraid that if we continue on with the, the deep restrictions that people will be uh, resistant to it in the future because yeah. it, this year was a good year. What would you tell the local agencies? Yeah. So the question is, now that we have some rainfall and snowfall in this year, should we, re should we lift some of the extreme restrictions on water use? I guess I would say yes for a couple of reasons. One is financially it's really difficult for water agencies to endure droughts because people use less water so they pay lower water bills. So I think financially some of the water agencies could actually benefit from selling more water. Um, secondly, I mean if you're in this perpetual state of massive uh, you know, um, conservation you know, it, it, you kind of become numb to it. So I, I would say I wouldn't. I wouldn't say we should go back to using water, you know, uh, like we used to. But I think we could probably not have to reduce our water use by twenty or thirty percent. Maybe we could have a five or ten percent, and see. Because a lot of the reservoirs in Northern California are filling up, uh, and that's why we built the whole water conveyance system. Is because we know it rains more in Northern California, and that's where a lot of our water is. So. The El Nino actually did occur in Northern California. It didn't really happen down here, but I, I would argue that we should really, we should uh, let off a little bit. Okay, so you said 2015 was one of the warmest winters we've had. Uh, what is the explanation for why, like, Marietta, Temecula, and, like, Elsinore, and, like, Huntington Beach got snow, like, so much then? Oh, so 2015 was the warmest year in California record, but why did it snow in um, Temecula? Well, I don't know. That's, that's weather, and I guess, it, <laughs> you know, but overall, even probably in Temecula, if you looked at all the daily temperatures and you and you average them all out it was probably the warmest year on record even with some snow so you could you could have a couple of occasionally cold days but if most of the days are warmer than average um, it, you're going to have a higher average so let me ask you a question so intuitively so so I always ask students so you, you know you listen to the news you read the newspaper probably you don't read the newspaper most of you but um, yeah. <laughs> some of you do <laughs> but you always hear oh it was record high temperature just last Few days, record high temperature in Los Angeles. How often do you hear record low temperature? You never hear it. We never have record low temperatures anymore, almost never. But, but I would say several times a year we have record high temperatures in California. So if climate's warming, you might expect that we're gonna have more record high temperatures than record low temperatures, which is the case. So the extremes in terms of, of weather are, are getting more extreme. So we're having more extreme droughts. Uh, we're also having more extreme wet periods too, but overall the climate globally is warming. Yeah. I might be wrong, but I believe that water control through the Delta, that's the federal responsibility. They must, they must keep that up so many millivolts of electrical kind of activity to save the Delta. Can we, two questions, one, can we afford to save the Delta? I mean, can we afford to all run all that fresh water through the Delta in order to save the Delta? The second question is, I believe that most of the water use in California, about 80% is by agriculture. Can we afford to keep agriculture in California? Well, is agriculture going to go the way the steel industry in Pittsburgh and the textile industry all along the Atlantic Coast? Yeah. So the two questions were, can, can we build this delta tunnel and divert fresh water from the delta without damaging it? And 
in the future, if we have less water, can, can we continue to have agriculture in California because agriculture is using 70 or 80 percent of the water? So the, to the first question, so the delta is naturally a variable ecosystem. It's used to having periods of low salinity, fresh water, and periods of high salinity and saltier water. So the natural ecosystem has been adapted to that variation in salinity. So a lot of the invasive species that inhabit the delta, and there's many of them, and they're the dominant species, have to have continuous fresh water to survive. So a lot of ecologists actually argue that the delta could, act, could recover and become a more natural kind of wetland environment if we had swings in salinity. So I think that the delta will not crash. I think it'll change. A lot of the invasive species that are dependent on fresh water will probably die off, and maybe that's a good thing. Um, and then the second question is agriculture. And so some of my colleagues in the, in the Department of Environmental Sciences have looked at this, and I think the question is agriculture will continue even if water supply goes down. The way they'll adapt is they'll go to higher value crops. So instead of you know, making, you know, growing rice, for example, they're going to grow almonds or, or fruit or some other high value crop that might take less water. So I think there's a lot of ability for, for farmers to actually adapt to this and choose crops um, and that actually deliver higher economic value. So I think agriculture is not going to go away. Yeah, so, so what, what happens to the salts in, so, in soils as we conserve water? And so the, another one of our colleagues um, studies this because things like micro-irrigation, drip irrigation actually cause salt to build up in soil. And, you know, there's a limit to how much salt you can build up in soil and still grow crops. And so that's one of the downsides to, to applying small volumes of water to soil. It's, this, this, you know, the, the old days of flood irrigation were actually pretty good for soil salinity because this big mass of water could leach the salts down below the rooting zone. But now, with little drip irrigation systems, we're putting little bits of water that don't get past the rooting zone. So this is a concern. Uh, actually, if you look at drinking water quality in Southern California, probably the major threat is salt. And the State Water Resources Control Board is, is very, very concerned about salt levels. Thanks. Uh, I was just wondering, besides kind of cutting down on our personal consumption of water, is there anything else we could do to help stay off this problem? Yeah, what, so besides c conserving yourself, what other things could people do to help our water, our water problems in California? Well, I guess try to exert political influence because a lot of these problems, you know, it's, it's going to take state and federal action to, to solve them. So I mean, I, I think the number one is, is, client, is global warming. You know, we need to do something about it. We can't continue to burn fossil fuels the way we've been burning them because our climate is it's going to, what I tell my students is we're going to have a Frankenstein climate by the end of the century. We're not going to know what's going to happen. And our whole society is predicated on, you know, regular ch changes in climate. Rainfall falls here. It's dry. It's during this period of time. The temperatures don't get above this or below that. You know, we, we built this entire complex society on a stable climate, and now we're completely disrupting it, and we don't know what's going to happen. There's, a, there's no period in the Earth's history that we can look at that'll tell us what's going to happen in the next 100 or 200 years. There's no analogous period. So I guess I would say, you know, try to elect the right people, you know, who are, who are concerned about water issues and issues of, about climate change. Well, let's thank Dr. Sipin.